preface of a Christmas hamper full of pictures and tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas hamper full of pictures and tales by various. Preface. This Christmas hamper, neat and trim, is full of sweet things to the brim. Its tales and rhymes and pictures bright will please you, dear, on Christmas night. When of such games as blind man's buff and hide and seek, you've had enough. End of preface. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Section 1 of A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales By Various Section 1 A Very Naughty Little Person a very naughty little person. I'm told I'm very naughty. I almost suspect I am. But somehow, when I shut the door, it's nearly sure to slam. Can you tell why my shoestrings break and tie themselves in knots? And how it is my copy books are always full of blots? It seems as if too many blots lived in one pot of ink. But when they're wet and shiny, they're pretty, don't you think? Why does my hair get tangled? What makes me talk all day? And why don't toys and books just try to put themselves away? I think that perhaps I might be good a little by and by. It's very hard, but sometimes I almost suspect I'll try. But now they say I'm naughty, and perhaps it's nearly true. There are so many naughty things for little folks to do. End of section one. Section 2 of A Christmas Hamper, Full of Pictures and Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Hamper, Full of Pictures and Tales, by Various. Chapter 2. Poor Uncle Tom. He seemed a funny old gentleman, the children thought, but still rather nice, especially when he brought those sweets out of his pocket and let them dip into the bag and take what they liked. They had seen him walking through the wood, and then when they left off playing, he had come to sit down beside them and ask them their names. Mine's Hughes, like father, said the eldest, and this is Lily and this is Tom. The old gentleman looked a little quickly at Tom. Who is he named after, he said. The children's faces grew grave. He is named after poor Uncle Tom, said Lily in a low voice, who we went to sea and was drowned. There was silence for a minute. Then the old gentleman spoke again. So poor Uncle Tom was drowned, was he? Yes, said Hugh. His ship was lost and everybody was drowned, except two or three that got in the boat, and Uncle Tom wasn't among them. The father waited and waited, but it wasn't any good. So then he put up a monument in the church, just where we can see it from our pew. And we always sing about the saints of God on his birthday, said Lily. And Father cries a little. No, he don't, said Hugh indignantly. Father's a man, and men don't cry. But he does, said Lily. I saw a weeny little tail on his cheek this morning, for today is Uncle Tom's birthday. And his voice goes all shaky-like, because he was so fond of poor Uncle Tom and says he was so good. The old gentleman sat silent, staring hard at the ground. Is it long since Uncle Tom went away? He said at last. It is ten years, replied Hugh. It was the year I was born. Ten years, so it is, murmured the old gentleman. Only ten years, and it has seemed like a hundred. The children looked at one another surprised. Did you ever know Uncle Tom? asked Hugh carelessly. Yes, I knew him well. I was on a ship. But you aren't drowned, cried Lily. The old gentleman smiled. No, he said. I wasn't drowned. I got off safe. Uncle Tom used to talk to me, though, 
about his old home. And one day he said they had carved his name on a tree in the park. And I was to go and see if I ever got home. Oh, I'll show you, says little Tom. It is on a beech tree, close by here. I'll show you. There it is. He pointed to a tree on which some initials and a date were cut deep into the bark. It is kept very fresh, said the old gentleman. I thought it would have been grown over by now. Father Wiz comes and tidies it up. On Uncle's birthday, said the boy. See, he's coming now. I'll go and tell him you are here. Father, he shouted, running off. Father, here's the gentleman who knew Uncle Tom. But when Father came near and saw the gentleman, he stared at him for a moment, as if he had seen a ghost, and then he gave a great cry. Tom, Tom, it is you yourself. And it was Uncle Tom, who had not been drowned after all. But when the ship was wrecked, had managed to get ashore to an island, and there had lived on the fishy caught, and birds, eggs, and cocoa nuts, watching for a sail like Robinson Crusoe, unless the sail came after ten long years. And when he reached England, he did not write, but came down to his old home to see who was there, for of course he had heard no tidings all the time. Nobody recognized him at the village, for the tropical sun had burned his skin brown, and the long waiting and the sorrow and the hardships had turned his hair white. Only his brother knew him by his eyes, for they too had loved each other very much. But what will father do with your tombstone? said Lily gravely, as she sat on her uncle's knee that night. It is such a pretty one, with a beautiful angel on it. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various. Chapter Three A Snowman. Oh, the beautiful snow. We're all in a glow. Nell, Dolly, and Willie, and Dan. For the primest of fun, when all's said and done, is just making a big snowman. Two stones for his eyes, look quite owlishly wise, a hard pinch of snow for his nose, then a mouth that's as big as the snout of a pig. And he'll want an old pipe, I suppose. Then the snowman is done, and tomorrow what fun, to make piles of snow cannon all day, and to pelt him with balls till he totters and falls, and a thaw comes and melts him away. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various Chapter 4 not such fun as it seemed. Isn't it fun, Dolly? asked Eric, as he and his little sister ran along the seafront as fast as their sturdy legs could carry them. Eric was the jolliest little boy imaginable, but, unfortunately, a little bit too fond of mischief, and Dolly was generally only eager to join in her brother's pranks. Just now they were running away from Nurse, who was down on the sands with Baby. They waited until her head was turned away, then off they ran. We'll go out to the rocks and play at being shipwrecked sailors. Eric went on. I've got some biscuits in my pocket, and I'll dole them out, piece by piece, and present we shan't have any more food unless a boat takes us off. Poor Eric. His play very soon became earnest, for he and Dolly waded out to a big rock in a very lonely part of the coast, and so interested were they in their game that they never noticed the tide coming in until it had surrounded them and there was no getting back. They waited on and on, hoping someone would come for them, and fearing every moment that the sea would cover the rock, and that they would be drowned. It was long past dinner time, and they were wet, through, and hungry, wretched, when at last a fisherman, who had been sent out to search for them, spied the two forlorn figures and rescued them. They went home hand in hand, very solemn and silent, expecting to get a good solding, but instead of that, Mother burst into tears of relief, and both Eric and Dolly, both so thoroughly ashamed of themselves for having frightened their darling mother so terribly, 
that it was a very long, long time before they got into mischief again. End of chapter four. Chapter five of A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various. Chapter five. On the Sands. The sun is shining brightly, the seagulls floating lightly, and the sea is calling children. Won't you come and play with me? So ask for breakfast early, while the waves are crisp and curly, and come with us to paddle, paddle gaily in the sea. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of A Christmas Hamper, Full of Pictures and Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various Chapter 6 Old Clothes The sunniest of days, the clearest and loveliest of blue seas, and I, a little lobster, young, proud, and as lively as a cricket. That is what people say, but I can't help thinking, as lively as a shrimp, would sound better. I always wear a lovely suit of armor, like those old warriors you read about. It is strong and firm and well-jointed, so that I can move ever so fast. Of course, not so fast as that silly little fish. He has armor, too, he says, but where is it inside? That seems queer to me. I can't quite believe it. But I want to tell you what a queer thing happened to mine not long ago. It grew small and shabby, like your last year's dress. And that is why I've called this story Old Clothes. Listen. I lived a very happy life, out at sea for some time, till one day I found this strange basket box thing. There were several other lobsters and one or two crabs sitting there, looking anxious and disturbed. And I soon found out that they had need to feel so, for there was no exit. That means, way out in plain words, our basket was joined to a strong rope, and I was attached to a cork floating on top of the water. Not long after I had fallen to this basket, which I now know was a lobster trap, and a boat rowed out from the shore, stopped just above us, and then we were lifted up, up, right out of the water, and placed in the boat. The next thing was a good deal of pushing and knocking about, and then someone tossed me carelessly out on the beach, saying roughly, too small for any use. But someone else thought differently. Another hand touched me, and another voice said, just the thing for my aquarium. What that I meant, I could not even guess, but it turned out to be the tiniest sea in the world. Steady old limplets, red anemones, hermit crabs, and shrimps were all there. It was a very nice home, with plenty of good food, the only drawback being want of space. And now the event happened that I promised to tell you about. My armor took to hurting me. You would hardly believe me. We all know that new clothes hurt sometimes, but old ones? It grew tighter and tighter. I wriggled about, feeling miserable. Oh, if only I could get out of this. At last, I grew desperate. This choked, tight feeling was too much. I gave a tremendous struggle and shook myself. Crickle, crackle went my old armor. Off it came and out I stepped. But oh, so tender and so nervous. The shrimps pranced round and knocked up against me, breaking and tormenting, till I could have screamed. I crept behind a stone and looked at my old armor, half sadly. It looked just like old me, only so still, and rather as if it had been out in the rain all night in a trunk. Then I glanced at the new me. Well, I was a pretty fellow, not so black any longer, but a reddish pink of lovely hue. Someone else took pride in my appearance. For I heard again a voice say, Look at my lobster. He has cast his shell. I hadn't, you know. It was the shell that had cast me. But these men can't know everything. The man touched me, but he hurt me almost as much as the shrimps, and I drank further still, behind the stone, out of his way. There I quietly lay for some days, till one morning, 
feeling braver and ever so much bigger, I stepped out for an early saunter. That moment came a voice. Oh, here's my lobster. Oh, he has grown. More than half as big as again. Down came the hand as before, and just to show him I was also half as strong again, I gave him a nip. He keeps his hand above water now, and me at arm's length. End of chapter six. Chapter seven of A Christmas Hamper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. A Christmas Hamper, full of pictures and tales by various. Chapter 7. Questions. Oh, where did they sell all the lilies and roses? The pandies and pudsies and funny snub noses. The dimpled wee chin chops and fat pinky knees of the dear little queer little babies one sees. And what would they want for some soft golden curlies, a pair of blue eyes and two teeth white as pearlies, a mouth like a rosebud just made for a kiss. I fear they would ask me a great deal for this. And where is the gentle school mistress who teaches the mothers and grannies their sweet baby speeches, their loveys and doveys and tender cuckoos that the newest new pet understands in two twos? Answers, alas and alas, you may search through the city, yet never find the shop where they sell things so pretty. But I think it's the angels from far, far away. Teach the mothers and grannies the sweet things they say. End of chapter 7. Recording by Paul Harvey. Chapter 8 of A Christmas Hamper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jack Ball. A Christmas hamper full of pictures and tales by Various. Chapter 8 A Lesson in Manners There once was a dear little queer little cat, the sweetest kit ever seen, who made up her mind to journey to town to see the Queen. Mr. Puggy, a teacher of manners and dancing, gave her a lesson or two. Observe my instructions, Miss Tabby, and be sure to do as I do. But Tabby espied her saucer of milk and made a dart at that, while Pug distressfully murmured, What a very ill-bred cat! End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of A Christmas Hamper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere A Christmas Hamper, full of pictures and tales by various. Chapter 9 The Prize Boat Don't do it, Dick, pleaded Dolly. "'Girls always spoil sport,' growled Mark as he saw Dick ready to give in. "'We shan't hurt the boat. Don't be silly, Dolly. "'Even if the sails do get wet, Tom can get fresh ones. "'And it will be better for him to know whether it will sail or not.' "'And the twins departed for the seashore with the boat in their hands. "'How they wished they had taken Dolly's advice when they saw the ship!' which had sailed so gallantly at first in the little cove, break from its moorings and drift out to sea. Tom had worked very hard for the prize of two pounds offered in a weekly paper for the best-made boat, not only for the sake of the money, but because the toys were to go to the home for orphans. And now all his work was gone. Oh, well, it can't be helped he said good-naturedly, when his first feeling of anger had passed. But I wish you chaps would leave my things alone. 
"'But it can be helped,' said Dolly, rushing in. "'See, a fisherman brought it to the shore, and it isn't a bit broken.' So the orphans got the boat after all, and had great fun sailing it in the river near the home. And what was perhaps more wonderful, Tom won the prize. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of A Christmas Hamper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Hill Kennedy. TonyHillKennedy.com A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various The Little Thief in the Pantry Mother dear, said a little mouse one day, I think the people in our house must be very kind, don't you? They leave such nice things for us in the larder. There was a twinkle in Mother's eye as she replied, Well, my child, no doubt they are very well in their way. But I don't think they are quite as fond of us as you seem to think. Now remember, Gray Whiskers, I have absolutely forbidden you to put your nose above the ground unless I am with you. For kind as the people are, I shouldn't be at all surprised if they tried to catch you. Gray Whiskers twitched his tail with scorn. He was quite sure he knew how to take care of himself, and he didn't mean to trot meekly after his mother's tail all his life. So as soon as she had curled herself up for an afternoon nap, he stole away and scampered across the pantry shelves. Ah, here was something particularly good today. A large iced cake stood far back upon the shelf, and Gray Whiskers licked his lips as he sniffed it. Across the top of the cake, there were words written in pink sugar. But Gray Whiskers could not read. He did not know that he was nibbling at Little Miss Ethel's birthday cake. But he did feel a little guilty when he heard his mother calling. Off he ran and was back in the nest again by the time his mother had finished rubbing her eyes after her nap. She took Gray Whiskers up to the pantry then, and when she saw the hole in the cake, she seemed a little annoyed. Some mouse has evidently been here before us she said, but of course she never guessed that it was her own little son. The next day, the naughty little mouse again popped up to the pantry when his mother was asleep, but at first he could find nothing at all to eat, though there was a most delicious smell of toasted cheese. Presently, he found a dear little wooden house, and there hung the cheese just inside it, in ran Gray Whiskers, but, oh, click, went the little wooden house, and Mousie was caught fast in a trap. When the morning came, the cook who had set the trap lifted it from the shelf, and then called a pretty little girl to come and see the thief who had eaten her cake. What are you going to do with him, asked Ethel. Why, drown him, my dear, to be sure. The tears came into the little girl's pretty blue eyes. You didn't know it was stealing, did you, Mousy dear? She said. No, squeaked Gray Whiskers sadly. Indeed, I didn't. Cook's back was turned for a moment, and in that moment, tender-hearted little Ethel lifted the lid of the trap, and out popped Mousy. Oh, how quickly he ran home to his mother, and how she comforted and petted him until he began to forget his fright. And then she made him promise never to disobey her again. And you may be sure he never did. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tony Hill Kennedy Chapter 11 of A Christmas Hamper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Hill Kennedy. 
A Christmas Hamper, full of pictures and tales, by various. Great Grandmother's Wish Did you ever see a fairy, Granny? said Trots. No, she said. But my great grandmother did. Oh, do tell me, cried Trots. Well, once upon a time, as she was carrying her butter to market, she picked up a cricket sixpence, and with it, and what she sold her butter for, she bought a little black pig. Now, coming home, she had to cross the brook, so she picked Piggy up in her arms and carried her over the brook. And lo, instead of a pig, there was a little fairy in her arms. Oh, cried Trots, what was it like? Well, it had a red cap on its head and a green frock, and it had gauzy wings, and it wanted to fly away, but Great Grandmother held it tight. Please let me go, said the fairy. What will you give me, said Great Grandmother. I will give you one wish, answered the fairy. So Great Grandmother thought and thought what was the best thing to wish for. And at last she said, Give to me and to my daughters, to the eleventh generation, the lucky finger and the loving heart. You have wished a big wish, said the fairy, but you shall have it. So she kissed Great Grandmother's eyes and mouth, and then she flew away. And did the wish come true, asked Trots? Always, always, answered Granny. We have been since then the best spinners and knitters in all the countryside, and the best wives and daughters. But, said Trots, what will the eleventh generation do when the wish stops, and the good luck? I don't know, said Granny, shaking her head. I suppose they'll have to catch a fairy of their own. End of chapter 11 Recording by Tony Hill Kennedy End of A Christmas Hamper Full of Pictures and Tales by Various